So the other thing is, you know, I, I've heard of some attorneys that love big data so much, they're like, I don't even do regular focus groups anymore. That's a huge mistake. Because not only do f live focus groups show you group dynamic interaction, and it confirms the big data, but it's how you practice being in front of a jury. You have to get used to practicing. One of the focus groups that everybody in my firm runs, and I make them run it, is they do Vordire focus groups. So you literally write out your Vordire, and I make them practice challenging for cause. One of the biggest uh, weaknesses I see across the board with lawyers is their ability to strike for cause. Sonia and, uh, and uh, uh, Rahul were up here earlier talking about how every trial they get 10 to 30 people struck for cause. Yeah, that's for somebody that's a pro, excellent at what they do, that's about right. You know, we've had those cases where we've had to strike, you know, 35 people to get the right panel. Um, but I'm able to do that because I practice striking jurors for cause all the time. And so it's a real simple focus group. You literally just get your 10 people, and you don't need more than 10. Don't, even if you're gonna, your panel's going to be 20 or 30, don't worry about it. Just practice with 10 people. But you get your 10 people up there, and you start your Vordire, and you run a, run a two-hour Vordire. You don't need to go more than two hours. You're not going to get through maybe all the questions you intend to ask, but start running through those, uh, that Vordire. And then when somebody gives you a bad answer, walk them down that path of, to disqualify them, to get them for cause. And it's amazing how many times I see attorneys not practice that, and they get into trial, they're like, damn it, if I would have only been able to get that one juror for cause, I just didn't know how to get them to that next level. Um, one of the things, and anybody that wants this, we will share it. I got my partner, Matt Grant, and my managing partner back there. We have these fancy, beautiful uh, sports coats. We're, we match, we did not coordinate, but they both look very nice. Uh, but that's my partner. We will send you our brief on educating, this is Nevada law, but you need to go get, make your own brief for your state on the same topic. You need to educate your judges ahead of time on the law as it relates to striking jurors for cause and rehabilitation. There's some really, really good law out there um, about what a judge can and cannot do on rehabilitation. Believe it or not, most of the judges I know don't know. They don't know the law actually on, on striking for cause. And so we want to make sure that we're doing that. And so we send this brief ahead of time. We file a trial memo, and we tell the judge, hey, FYI, here's the law as it relates to challenges for cause. Here's bias. By the way, there's lots of different types of bias you should be aware of. Um, and so we file this brief. And I then ask the judge before trial, I'm like, hey, Your Honor, I, I just want to make sure you got our trial brief on before we pick the jury. Uh, on challenging for cause. And some of the judges that I appear in Nevada, it's kind of nice. We, we're, it's not like being in California where you may never see a judge twice. In Nevada, we have like, in, in Vegas, it's, I think it's like 31 judges or something. And you may only appear in front of 17 because the rest do criminal or something. So those judges get used to seeing you. The first time you file it, they may kind of look at you like, what's this? Uh, the second time you file it, they're like, I got it. The third time, they're like, no, I now understand it. And I'm like, great. And then they start getting the right thing. So we will give you that if anybody wants it. Uh, you can email me at sean, S-E-A-N, at claggettlaw.com. That's C-L-A-G-G-E-T-T-L-A-W.com. And copy my partner, Matt, which is just his first initial M, last name Granda, G-R-A-N-D-A, at claggettlaw.com, and we'll get that to you. And then really work, and then the other thing too is share with each other. If you all work in your states together to share this information, it's gonna make it a hell of a lot better because you, you start researching it and you start helping each other, and then you can add to the brief. And if you've like added and the new case comes out like, hey, I updated the brief, share it with your group. You know, a lot of you are on listserv, so it's a good thing to do. John Campbell, everybody. Hey there. Uh, I, forgive me. Um, we, the, the tech setup here does not allow you to mirror your own screen, which was not something we knew. So we're figuring it out. Um, but 
but we'll, we'll get to the same place a different way. All right. That's how you do. But I would mention, Sean, that, um, yeah, I agree completely that in, in my view, so there are a few attorneys that, that, that we work with who have these very detailed motions they file ahead of voir dire, and, and they continue to sort of develop them, and they become a weapon, right? Because I think the thing we forget is that a lot of trial judges are actually looking to you for direction, um, whether they say it or not. Um, and if you become the person who is a trusted source of information, who's providing them guidance, um, to some degree, it's the availability heuristic. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but here's how you can think of the uh, availability heuristic. If somebody asks you, do you know a good Thai food place, and you only know one, and the one time you ate there, it was just okay, you're still likely to tell them that you like the Thai food place, because it's better than saying, no, I don't know any place for you to eat, right? It's the one that you have available. If a judge is thinking, I'm not quite sure what to do with, with Vordir, and then they have this nicely laid out with headings and organization motion about the law and what's allowed and what should happen, it's available and it makes their job easier and they'll look at it. And so one thing I'd add as another weapon in this is that in the last year or so, we developed a, a research paper, the University of Denver working with Stanford, Cornell, and Arizona State, put together a research paper. And here's what we did. We presented three different civil cases to about 2,000 jurors. And in those civil cases, before they read and worked through and watched evidence in the cases, we either showed them almost no voir dire, kind of like what you'd see in a federal court. If you've ever been in a federal court picking a jury, you know one of the questions a judge will often ask is, does anybody here have anything that might make them biased in this case? Which is, of course, an entirely useless question, right? And what you find is what we all knew, which is nobody knows how to answer that, so nobody says anything. And then in another setting, we asked a separate set of jurors, much more detailed voir dire like many of us would like to do. How do you feel about non-economic damages? How do you feel about caps? What do you think about the burden of proof for the plaintiff? They only have to prove, you know, more likely than not, and that's only a little more. How do you feel about that? We asked them specific questions to the case. How do you feel about doctors? How do you feel about insurance companies? How do you feel about personal injury lawyers? And then we measured what happened, which was, of course, there are people that have biases. And what you know is, is first of all, if you don't ask those questions or the court won't let you, you don't find those biases. So we were able to quantify how common they are. This won't surprise anybody in the room, but bias that runs against the plaintiff is about three times as common as bias that runs against the defense. So what does that mean? It means that in any venue in which we are not allowed to conduct voir dire, we have a significant disadvantage and the defendant gains an advantage because they have more people that are already prone to not like lawsuits and lawyers, okay? So we could quantify that. We could also then, we had half of, so follow with me, people answer these questions and they have biases. They say, I don't like non-economic damages, for example, or they say, I have a cap in my head already on damages and I could never go above it regardless of the evidence. Well, what, what do a lot of judges do? What do a lot of judges do with that? Can you still be fair? They rehabilitate them, right? We don't want to lose them. We need to keep all those jurors. They're valuable because God knows we couldn't find more people. Uh, so we keep them. So they rehabilitate them. So we showed the jurors, half of them, a video of a judge rehabilitating them. And then we asked them, can you be fair? So we showed that to over 1,000 jurors, judge in a robe saying, you've expressed some views that might be inconsistent with the instructions I'll give you, can you set aside your views and follow the instructions as given and be fair? Okay, so let's call it a thousand people. It was a thousand and some change. How many do you think said no, I can't? Seven. Seven. It's a useless question because of course everyone says I can be fair. Then we looked at, did these people who now have expressed bias, right, let's follow, they expressed bias they swore they can set it aside, and now they're on the jury. Did they act differently than the people who did not, that expressed bias but weren't rehabbed? No, of course not. The rehab didn't change their bias. It did change one thing. At the end of the study, we asked the jurors, do you think your personally held beliefs influenced your decision? And the people who had been rehabbed were more likely to say no 
because they were now, they believed they'd been immunized. All right, so in your arsenal of things to file with courts, I would say file, and I'll give you a way to find it, file this, file this report, file this research paper, because what it shows is, is that bias exists in the pool, that if you seat jurors without voir dire, you will seat jurors who cannot listen to the evidence. For example, we showed that people who are opposed to damage caps, I mean, who support damage caps, were also worse on liability, which shouldn't be true, right? Just because you think there's a cap on damages doesn't mean you should be harder on the plaintiff's liability case, but they are. We also showed that ju judicial rehabilitation is not only ineffective, it's perverse, okay? And this is data that's published by, when Stanford and Cornell sign it, the court, it's a little harder for the court to say, well, it's not real research, okay? So we should start to educate courts. We've started this in Colorado, and we've had a couple judges now work through the research and, and grant motions for extended voir dire, all right? And in some of our cases, the difference between getting to ask a couple questions or actually getting to dig in a little, the difference between the judge actually excusing people for cause as opposed to rehabilitating terrible people and then putting them on our jury or making us use peremptories, right, is, can be the difference in winning or losing, all right? And so if you want to look for this, you could look for Campbell, that's me, Salerno, S-A-L-E-R-N-O, Salerno, that's Jessica Salerno. If you don't know her research, she's at ASU, you should read it. Um, and if you do something like Campbell Salerno Vordier, you'll find the paper. Um, it, it is, it's going to be published in Law and Human Behavior, which is, I think, the best peer-reviewed empirical journal. Uh, and so our whole goal was to get something out there that could be used by the practicing bar to educate judges. Our next goal is to get in front of the federal judiciary uh, and start to talk to them directly about the challenges that are, are occurring because, of course, if you have a constitutional guarantee for a fair and impartial jury, if you have, a, in some states, you don't have a constitutional guarantee, you have a state constitution or you have a presidential guarantee or you have a statutory guarantee, but in almost every state, it's guaranteed one way or the other. If we're seating people who, by definition, cannot listen to the evidence, that certainly doesn't meet the standard. And let's just, let's just call it what it is, and this is what I tell judges. If we're seating people who already have their minds made up either way, then that means that all the rulings on discovery, all the fights over summary judgment, all the depositions, all the daubert, all the experts, all this time in court was a show because the case was over before we sat down. And that isn't right, right? Now, most judges and most honest trial lawyers on both sides will say, you're right, that's not right, right? So I think we need to get this in front of courts, and so I would strongly second the idea that we need detailed, careful motions on voir dire. You know, one of the things that I've done where a judge has wanted to limit me is I just said, Your Honor, with all due respect, how many biased jurors should we let sit? The judge looked at me like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I'm just, in all honesty, if we don't have meaningful voir dire, we're going to sit jurors that are biased either against the plaintiff or against the defendant. It's inevitable. So how many of them should we sit? I just, the judge wasn't pleased with my question because it put the judge in a weird spot. But you know what the judge said? Okay, I'll give you some latitude. Well, it's important to get that latitude because one of the things too, Rahul brought this up this morning and I keep going back because I, he's one of my favorite lawyers. I think he's just fantastic in his presentation. but. What, what he was explaining was that a judge said, I'm gonna give you 45 minutes. He goes, how about this? How about if I waste any time, you cut me off? And the judge said, okay. And then like two days later, he's still picking a jury. <laughs> um, but that only happens because he's prepared. You know, I, I watched Joe Freed, and I think he's presenting here uh, on speed trial. And this idea is like, I, I heard all these lawyers and I, I, I keep, I listen to what people are talking about, right? And I heard some lawyers that I knew didn't work real hard and, and didn't prepare their cases very well. Like, oh, that speed trial is a great idea. I'm like, not for you, it ain't. <laughs> because it's not, that takes a lot of preparation. Joe's one of the most prepared attorneys you'll ever meet. And he has to be to be able to do a speed trial. You want to make sure you're not wasting the judge's time? You've practiced your vortier. You know what questions you're going to ask. You're not going in cold. The way we do our jury selection, if we're picking a jury on Monday, I will have done a focus group jury selection 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I take Sunday off. I don't like working the day before trials, so I do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and now on Monday, I'm on day four of jury selection, and I'm feeling really healthy about my preparation, and I don't waste time. And then you start to develop a reputation in your community, like he's really good. He's really good at what he does, so the judges start having more confidence in allowing you to have your time to do your jury selection. So, but you have to practice. And so, don't waste time. Don't, don't do silly things like try to become friends with the jury. Um, just ask the questions that need to be asked. Um, and you'll be fine with that. And that comes from practice. Well, you know, it's funny what you say about, uh, about practice. I mean, I'll just second this because I think sometimes I almost feel embarrassed to give advice because it sounds so obvious. Um, you should practice for deer. Sounds obvious, right? You should practice anything that's this important. Um, but if we were being honest, you know, I think we all probably as young lawyers and or we know people still who wing voir dire. And I agree. I think, you know, we, we test and practice the sequencing of voir dire in the same way that we test and practice openings. Um, because not only is voir dire important, but the order of voir dire is important and the patience in voir dire to identify the jurors that you need to walk off for cause, but maybe walk them off a little later right, so you don't signal to everybody what's happening is important too. There's discipline in that. Maybe we should back up if, if that's okay, because you know, I was the late guy, but can I? Can yeah, I, please can do, I, can I back please up? do. Um, let, let's back up to maybe a concept that I think's lurking in what we're saying, uh, and it's this. So I put this up, you're thinking, what in the world does a product launch process have to do with talking about if you want. juries? Um, it only has one slide. So oh, let perfect. Let me show you what happens if I click around. Nothing at all. Okay, great. Um, okay. That's a nice so, slide. You like, like that? That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Slide. That's, it's pretty fancy. Um, thanks, Google. Uh, so this, why do we have a product launch process up? Let's see if we can get there. All right, so look at this. Let's imagine, before we, you're, you're going to read it, I'm violating the rule that you have something on the, on the screen so you'll read it, but that's okay. But imagine I was looking up earlier today, I was Googling like project, product failures. And then I thought, I'm not going to Google it, I'm going to ask, can anybody think of a product that was launched that was a colossal failure. I, I, new Coke. So we're gonna get to New Coke in like one minute because New Coke is actually a nice tale that's like one more step from, from just a colossal product failure. You're right, it was a colossal product failure, maybe the biggest in like marketing history. Can anybody think of any others that just came out? Or no, I don't care when. Oh, Nova. Because, of course, Nova, anybody speak Spanish? Nova, no-go. Yeah, it's not a great thing to name a car. Um, no-go in Spanish. Sure, yep, yep, that one could have used some help. What else? What's that? Blu-ray disc. Yeah, Blu-ray disc didn't, didn't really make it, did it? Um, they, they tried hard. <laughs> What's that? You bought them, yeah. I remember. Where did that go? Sort of like Google Glasses, which they're trying to bring back, but those, those didn't really crush it either. Apple Newton. Apple Newton. Yes, that was like the personal keeper. Personal yes, it was. Oh, yeah, good, good. Didn't, didn't do so well. Well, if you think about some of these, not all of them, but you think about some of these, and maybe we could even just think hypothetically. Imagine if tomorrow we said, we're going to make a new product for the market. Here's what we'll do. We'll get three or four of us in a room, we'll, we'll brainstorm the product, we'll design the product, we'll build the product, and then we'll release the product. And, and here's the plan. None of us leave the room until it's done. Anybody in on my process want to invest? What's missing? Come on. It's not market driven, data's dri missing. Time? People, what does the client want? You know, so, so now look at a product launch process, and this is like, go find it on Google, but look at developing new product, determining product market fit, conducting TAM and market analysis, building out competitive landscape, capturing customer and user feedback, naming the product, recommended pricing, crafting positioning. All this is phase one, because first we have to ask, is there a market for the product? Do other products like it exist? 
what, how, you know, is there, is there space for hours? Is this, the, are we selling Mont Blancs or, or Bix? Right, we have to do all these things. And then launch planning. Well, we gotta figure out who are we launching it to? How are we launching it? How are we selling it? How often? Pre-launch marketing. How are we gonna tell people about it? Product launch. Ensuring successful launch, training internal teams. And then look at this, sustaining launch, supporting long tail marketing. And then I could add six, reviewing success, sort of the, the look back at what we did right and wrong so that we do it better the next product, right? Your case is a product. Your case is a product, all right? Before you take it, if you know the venue in which it will be filed, you know if there's an audience for your product, okay? And you know enough about that product to at least kick the tires on it. But how often do we do this? They kick, we kick the tires by walking down to our partner's office and saying, what do you think? See any challenges with that? I mean, any? That the only voice we have is another plaintiff's lawyer who happens to be our partner, isn't a juror, never will be a juror, thinks like a lawyer, yeah, I want to ask you guys this. What percentage of cases that come into your office do you say no to? Think about that for a second. Our office says no to about 90% of the cases, probably more. Um, and some of the cases we're not sure about and we're thinking about, we'll focus group before we say yes. Because what we don't want to do is there's a, all of us have, we're all, each of us sitting in this room as a commodity, right? And don't kid yourself, that's what you are. And there, you yourself has value. As you go to these classes, you increase your value. And then, you, you know, the better you get, you have more value. But one thing we're all equal in is the amount of time we have. And so where do you want to be spending your time? On what type of cases do you want to be spending that time doing? I know a lot of lawyers that go, you know, God, I don't know how you do it. How do you get those verdicts? I do all these trials, and I just don't get those verdicts. I'm like, yeah, no shit, man. You settled all your good ones and you tried every freaking rat ass crappy case you got. It's hard. <laughs> you get that case where, yeah, well, you know, there was no proper damage, six week gap in treatment after the wreck and, uh, and then didn't comply and, oh yeah, and they lied about their past medical condition. I don't know why I lost. Uh, <laughs> I do. It was your case selection. Look. Uh, a big part of what we have to do as lawyers is take less cases, first of all. Because if you want to do what we were talking about and what you're hearing all these great lawyers, we have Brian Panish back here, in my view, one of the greatest of all time. Uh, one of the things I know about Brian is he's going to do a case. He has time to think about the case. If, if I told Brian, hey, Brian, I want you to handle 200 cases in lit, how would you, what would you tell me? No way, right? Not going to happen. I can look in this room and know that there's attorneys that are handling 30, 40, 50 cases at the same time that are in litigation. That's not possible. You shouldn't have probably more than eight to 10, and that's pushing it. If you as a lawyer have 10 cases in litigation, that's really freaking hard. You're not sleeping much if you're actually litigating them right. Yeah, well, I mean, because part of what I, I completely agree, so I mean, part of this is, so let, let's, let's round this out to one more point because then I think it'll help all of us. So here's, here's the next thing, and we, we're having a problem with the tech, so I'm just gonna do it like this, because we got a crowd, which is kind of nice. I've gotten reliant on tech because you have to do so many things online now. The only way you can survey an audience is tech, but here you are. Um, listen, I'm gonna say a question, and I want you to raise your hand if you think it's an empirical question. And in case we're thinking, what's an empirical question? An empirical question is a question that has an answer. Right? It is not, what is the best flavor of ice cream? Right, because we can all disagree. Um, I spend a lot of, I spend about half my life in Madrid, um, and that's where I live sort of half the time. And there's a saying there that you, no deberías discutir de gustos, which is you shouldn't argue about opinions or sort of preferences. I think it's wise, right? We don't, we shouldn't fight about what ice cream we like or what car we enjoy driving or whether it's whether Sean's coat is handsome or not. We shouldn't, we shouldn't fight about things like that. Okay, we can all disagree. Um, I like it. Thank you. But, but we, we, there are empirical questions, right? There are questions. For example, new Coke, we'll come to it now. You know, we, what percentage of people will like new Coke is an empirical question. 
that had an answer that Coke did not discover until it launched a shitty product that then tanked and costed a lot of money and billions in reputation that it had to recover over a period of years. Okay? Remind me, and we'll talk about why that happened, because that's kind of like next level of what we have to do carefully, studying things. But let's try this first. Empirical questions. Will my case get better if I dismiss the individual doctor and proceed only against the hospital? Is that an empirical question or not? How many think it's an empirical question? Okay, I'm not gonna say yes or no yet. Let's just, let's just go through a few. How about this? How much money can I ask for before I upset enough jurors that it damages my liability rate and or my damage award? Is that an empirical question or not? How about this? Is my, plant, my plaintiff credible when testifying? Empirical or not? How about this one? Um, what is the likely range of fault that the non-party will receive uh, in this case, given the evidence? Okay. How about this? What is the most predictive voir dire question I can ask to quickly sort the best jurors from the worst jurors for my case? All right, you're getting the point. Listen, they're all empirical questions. Now here's the, the punchline of this lesson. Most of us go to trial and we don't have the answers to any of them. Any of them. We have our gut, and I don't discredit gut because the more you educate your intuition over many, many trials and years, the better it gets, and you become a certified expert that can make reasonably refined, instinctive decisions. Okay, I'm looking at Brian. Look, there's people that are going to have a lot of built up knowledge and intuition and make better decisions the longer they've been doing it if they've been paying attention to when they lose and why, right? If they have systems in place, they're systematic about evaluating results. But here's the thing. All of the questions I asked are empirical because they have an answer and you can find that answer if you study your cases and I'm not just talking about big data. I do big data, but look, there's real value in sitting down with jurors in 10 or 12, 15, doing that over and over again. And there's real value in what we do, which is getting three, 400, 500, 1,000 people to look at cases. But I can tell you, if we sit down and we, if we present the plaintiff and defense case in a very realistic way, but distilled, plaintiff case, defense case, Sean's trash truck case, we built in the documents John, Sean was gonna use, we built in some of the testimony. We built in the surveillance video that was found at that house, not really yeah. security footage from a home. We built in the defense and all the things they were saying in their motions and pretrial motions and in their summary judgments, and we ran it. You know what you can do when you got enough people? You can show one group a request for 20 million, one group a request for 40 million, and one group a request for 65 million, change nothing else in the whole presentation, and then observe the result of those three requests and ask a simple statistical question, which is, of these three, which produces the highest win rate? Which produces the highest overall damage scenario? Right? Now, some people would say, yeah, but I only get 12 jurors or six jurors, or, so the hundreds don't matter. That's like saying if you go downstairs that you can play 15s or 18s, you'll get the same results in blackjack. We have to play the odds, right? So if we can say that on average, this request produces more winning jurors that give more money, then we should use that request. Does that mean you will never have a bad result? No, but you will have more good results, right? Just like you'll win more hands playing 18 and 19 than 15. Yeah? So all of these questions have answers. And what, if, if I had one thing I want you to leave with, and I could just leave after this, if you would just say, I remember it, I got it, I'd leave happily is that the practice of law is a little less art and a little more science than maybe we used to think.